I'm a CTO at FMI Technologies um, and a research affiliate at IAS. And uh, you know, FMI is, is a firm uh, run by physicists that seeks to use physics inspired tools and methods to essentially um, forecast financial time series, if, if you may call it, you know. So we have a couple of hedge funds now and uh, uh, you know, what we do concerns you know, high algorithmic trading at medium to high frequencies. So, you know, like that's some of the, the background I have. Uh, today I'll talk not so much about trading and uh, ex explicitly uh, financial time series, but I'll focus more on um, a certain area of quantitative finance, uh, which has to do with options pricing and also certain approaches to it that involve using physics based methods to characterize the uh, like dynamics of options prices and uh, the techniques are general. They, they can be applied beyond options as well to uh, a variety of stochastic processes. Uh, this is actually part two of a talk uh, I gave in um, at this conference in January, where I spoke in detail about um, about uh, uh, symmetries and symmetric groups. So I, I think I'll kind of skim over that and I'll get to the point about the, the black holes, uh, I think, hopefully sooner. So, uh, you know, th there's been a bunch of work done in this field of econo physics. People have used path integrals to model options and equity dynamics. Uh, they've used theories, you know, related to phase transitions, turbulence, uh, and uh, even recently gravity duels. And uh, the, the all, I mean, you don't need to know what all these things mean. The All you need to know is that uh, one feature crucial to all these physics-based approaches is the use of symmetries or symmetry groups to constrain the dynamics of these, these systems. So, uh, you know, I'll just explain what it is and motivate that. And then I'll skim over uh, the use of symmetries. So uh, essentially a symmetric group is a set of all possible transformations that leave a system un un unchanged. So in this case, it's just uh, different kinds of rotations and uh, all, then uh, rotations are 120 and then you, uh, and also reflections. Um, but uh, it, it was in 1978, so groups have been known for, known for a long time, but it was only 1978 that uh, Sasha Polyakov had a dream to characterize the dynamics of systems uh, that would other be, otherwise be described by path integrals or SDs solely in terms of symmetric groups. And he launched this so-called conformal bootstrap program, which in finance terms is numerator invariant and uh, unlike SDs also describes multi-scale dynamics. And uh, in financial time series, uh, like symmetries were, uh, have been known for a while. So, you know, time translation and log price translation invariance are assumptions that most modelers make. And self-similarity of time series has been known since the time of model bro, who notices it for cotton prices. So the, the fact that you can zoom in and zoom out of uh, these price processes without changing the statistical properties of, of, of these processes and uh, these symmetries appear to hold um, in actual markets. And in uh, also in crash modeling, where people such as Johansson have used multi-agent models to uh, essentially characterize crashes, e even in these, um, they have found certain modified versions of these scaling symmetries, you know, um, such, as, like, such as the fact that the deviation of, of price from the you know, critical price at the time of crash is also described by these uh, uh, these uh, power law scalings with these complex complex critical exponents. Uh, and, and anyway, I mean uh, the the point is uh, that uh, there are lots of motivations, and and the final one, which is maybe the most useful to us today, is uh, the fact that you know since 1998, the in quantum theory that there are like. Uh, the uh, different dynamics of nonlinear or strongly coupled quantum systems has been described by linearized, you know, gravi so-called gravitational systems in one higher dimensional, where, you know, gravitational is a purely mathematical term here that, that means uh, in a sense geometric. And uh, you can essentially map observables from the bulk to, bulk to the boundary and uh, do the simpler calculation in the bulk and uh, get the more complicated results on the, on the boundary. And uh, Yu Nakayama had constructed holographic duels for, for markets, for financial markets using uh, Lifshitz invariance. So, uh, you know, we, I mean, that's one of the things I plan, plan to use. And uh, 
um, so yeah, uh, I mean, so what I would do in the first version of this talk is basically introduce Lie groups and uh, run through the, the general program. So I'll just explain the philosophy of what I do without going into the details of the calculations. Uh, what I would do is, is that, you know, we start with a symmetry group G and write down as Lie algebra and then write down what that Lie group is doing to log price time space. And I would impose that these observables are invariant under the action of these representations. And then, then, then see what leverage we can get by just using symmetry groups without, uh, may, uh, without looking at PDs and SDs in the first place. And what I would constrain are different observables of these price processes, which can be expectation values. Uh, they can be two point density functions, higher point density functions or autocorrelation functions, et, et cetera. But the only, only one I, uh, most people are concerned with are the two point, two point density functions, which are used in options pricing. And um, essentially, I, I just came over this. Um, it, it's not important for you to know what these symbols mean. Uh, what, all, all that's important is that uh, all these symbols essentially, you know, like characterize the, uh, the generators of these, this Lie group. And the, uh, these are basically commutation relations, which, which, which tell you how they fail, fail to commute with each other. And just, just using this, you know, we can get in, uh, tremendous leverage. So after, after doing this, you know, we um, write down representations of these symbols. So what these symbols are doing to price and time or to space and time, if you're, um, if, if, if you, if you so, so, so like to think of things that way. So H is just shifting time back and forth. P is just shifting price back and forth. Uh, G is basically kind of rotating the, the uh, price and time axis with respect to each other. And expansions and dilatations are C and D are kind of zooming in and zooming out of your, of your, price, your price process. And, uh, you know, we want that all our observables are invariant under these the action of, actions of the generators. So, uh, you know, we, we start with applying them one by one. You know, so for the one point function, it's you know trivial, you just get a constant, but with for the two point density function, for instance, you apply log price and log and time transition variance to get the fact that uh, your density function does not depend on price and time independently, but it depends only on the on the, uh, the difference between them. And you impose scale invariance to get uh, your uh, two point function to be of, of this form. You uh, determine it up to an arbitrary function of this cost ratio and you impose boots and you get that this arbitrary function has to be an exponential and you transform back to canonical coordinates and you get uh, essentially a nonlinear generalization of Black-Scholes. So it's almost Black-Scholes, but it's allowed to be nonlinear because this like Delta in the, in the, in the denominator is allowed to differ from half, which would be its Black-Scholes value. And uh, if, 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 if you were to assume uh, like a PDE, you know, you, you would see that the extent to which the, uh, your delta deviates from half can be expressed as a power series in the, the nonlinearity by which you deform the, the Black-Scholes equation. So uh, this is, you know, pretty cool that uh, even just by using symmetry groups, you know, you, you discover nonlinear dynamics that uh, of a kind that you, you perhaps would have been much more difficult uh, with by using PDs or SDs, and uh, you know, so uh, essentially, I, I play a similar kind of game for you know crashes, where it's, it's observed that you know uh, time and price scale you scale with the same factor here, you know, uh, and not by, by off by a factor of two. So your Hurst exponent is now goes to one, whereas it was half in uh, the case of Black Scholes. And you get another point of enhanced symmetry, the 2D conformal group. And uh, this also corresponds to, you know, going to an, a kind of, in, in a rough sense, going to an infinite volume limit of, uh, infinite volatility limit, sorry, infinite volatility limit of uh, you know, Black Scholes. So uh, I, I would, you know, I, I play the same game here. Uh, again, you don't need to go into the details of these calculations, but the, the point is that by assuming invariance under the generators of your 2D conformal group, you uh, again, you know, get uh, get a two point density function, which is uh, you know completely determined up to up to constant factor, and uh, you know by going back to canonical coordinates, you get 
essentially a two point function which is a cauchy cauchy two point function which other people which people have empirically observed uh, you see in terms of financial crashes uh, such as the you know covid induced crash in march march 2020 um so uh, you know you can uh, again you know play the play the pde game and and try to try to relate these to pdes and uh, you find that uh, you know uh, 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 so um if if you if you try to write down pds essentially corresponding to um black shoals and nonlinear decisions you you find that essentially if you try to set mass to zero in in for instance this deformed version of black shoals you get a different group than if if it tends to zero so you know it's it's order of limits issue and uh, you know financially like that that's the difference between setting volatility to infinity or making it 10 10 to infinity and uh, you know you you see that essentially the, uh, so if, if you set volatility to infinity you know you will get uh, another group which is the the m conformal group and uh, you'll we'll see later how you, you can get it through um, other other techniques as well you know using holography holographic embedding so i mean the, the point is just to just to give you a flavor of of the what different groups can do and the power that that they have uh, the most general general kind of scaling is uh, where you know time and price uh, scale uh, differently but now time scales where you know if you set time to lambda to z times time and price to lambda times times log price to lambda times log price you know you get an invariance where z is is arbitrary and you see that okay z equals 2 will describe black holes or z equals 1 describes the conformal markets which correspond to crashes but uh, the maybe the most realistic uh, model you know or to describe data in at least in in uh, equity markets is when z is uh, like dynamical and it uh, you know changes uh, changes rapidly and uh, and uh, or you know at least when z is fixed we know we get the the like lipschitz group uh, which which we can talk about and then we can think about the like dynamics right at the end when we talk about black holes and such uh, such things so the the lichter's group is really simple it just consists of three operators you know uh, the time translation log price translation and the dilatations you are just shifting time and price and, and scaling and uh, you know you get uh, that just imposing invariance under this uh, constrains your two point function uh, again up to an arbitrary function of this particular cross ratio Uh, which is kind of related to distance to default and credit modeling, uh, but in, in in this context, it's just a cross ratio, and uh, the Lipschitz group is not uh, constraining enough to give you something more more than that. Uh, there's a boost enhanced Lipschitz group. You know, you you can play the same game, and uh, essentially, what what ends up happening is that, uh, and then yeah, you you can end up making a a connection to. the a pd you know it, it turns out that many people are familiar with fractional brownian motions where you know your uh, you have these uh, fractional powers of these uh, different derivatives spatial and temporal derivatives and it uh, like turns out that um, you know these this lipschitz symmetries are related or they're related to fractional to generalized fractional brownian motions as, as well and uh, you know you you can play Uh, like different games uh, describing the dynamics of these fbms using also using lipschitz, lipschitz symmetry and uh, the basic summary of this this whole um, uh, this whole group group theoretic description is that you know you uh, you have you know we've seen the interplay between four groups you have the nonlinear black holes equation described by the by the schrodinger group and you know if you go to the large volatility limit but you do not set it to infinity you get the uh, massive conformal group and if you set it to infinite volatility you know you get exactly uh, the the nonlinear uh, you know conformal group the 2d conformal group and uh, if you you know play the game f- from the other other side that there's another way to approach this crash crash dynamics and like that is through the uh through the lifshitz group you know where uh, you can dynamically vary your z from uh from you know 2 to 1 or your host exponent from half half to 
and again approach crash crash dynamics. Now, uh, you know, this is kind of a recap of 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 my, my previous talk. The main focus of this talk is this whole notion of holography, uh, which was championed in quantum theory by Juan Maldacena in 1998, where he discovered that uh, that you know strongly coupled conformal theories in like de, uh, or strongly coupled strongly coupled, which means like nonlinear, uh, which essentially nonlinear stochastic processes under stochastic quantization. So these highly nonlinear processes, when you embed them in one high dimension, they become linearized, and things look much much more beautiful. Uh, and uh, you know, like that's what uh, what we can do in in a variety of different ways. Um, First, I'll give you like a toy model of how this can happen in a very controlled case. And then I think we'll get into holography proper, uh, which is uh, more complicated. So here, um, so you, you start with this klein gordon equation in three dimensions, which is invariant under the 3D conformal group. So you, you just have a free equation. Uh, there is no nonlinear non term, no nonlinear deformation. And uh, if you introduce light concoordinates, you you, you can you can uh, you know actually write it this way, where uh, you, you can express it in terms of the light concoordinates. And you see that if you fix this uh, partial derivative with, the, with respect to one of the light con light concoordinates, if you fix it to some m, uh, you know, and if, so that's equivalent to making this following ansatz, you will get a familiar kind of equation with the uh, one time time derivative and uh, and like a double uh, price or spatial derivative and uh, you know this is essentially under a change of coordinates and uh, making mass uh, or, or sending this m to uh, making uh, it uh, under analytical continuation this is the same as the the schrodinger equation or a black scholes equation right uh, so you've essentially introduced by dimensionally reducing from three dimensions to two dimensions, you've introduced a particular mass a mass scale in the problem, or like a, a time scale or a length scale in, in your in your problem. And uh, you know the the same thing uh, you know like can also be done. So so what what's, so what's what's the use of doing that? The use of doing that is that that um, say two point functions are much easier to calculate in the three dimensional theory. Uh, than in in, in the uh, like two dimensional one, and so you do the calculation in three D. It's really simple. They are you know conformal, uh, conformal two point functions, and you then you apply this partial Fourier transform. You know uh, you do this light cone uh, light cone reduction from d plus one to d d dimensions, and um, you know you you uh, by 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 doing that you. Um, you know, take remove the fractional derivative out, and then you you solve this integral to actually get uh, the uh, Black Scholes or the you know Schrodinger Schrodinger equation two point function or the Black Scholes density function from something much an object that was much simpler, uh, which belonged to a much simpler group. So, and uh, you can play the same game by again starting with the same klein gordon equation in three three dimensions, but instead of fixing the like derivative along the light cone coordinate. If you just fix it along uh, a spatial coordinate, you will get this familiar equation, uh, which is kind of like a massive klein gordon equation. And uh, you, you you get that you know you, you can change between the the phi variable in three dimensions and the psi variable in two D again using uh, another kind of partial Fourier transform, if if you may say so. And uh, you get that. All expectation values of interest in your, for instance, Black Scholes or your massive conformal theory, you know, they can be obtained from a null, this null, redu null reduction of the same observable in your higher dimensional theory by applying these suitable transforms. And um, yeah, I mean, I think I, <laughs> yeah. So in, in in the in the M conformal case, uh, you play the same game and you get, uh, you know, these. Uh, K, 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 like Bessel functions, which were formed by, um, you know, Kaku-Schardze as well, and they reduced to black holes at, at small small volatility, and and uh, this is uh, essentially the same as you know, like a large large volatility limit that interpolates between uh, black holes dynamics at one end and conformal dynamics at the other end. 
And so why, why do these t- techniques work at all? You know, it seems like there should be no reason that, that they should work. It seems kind of like an accident, but it, it's not. You know, it, it's completely obvious from the point of view of group theory. Uh, you know, the, the fact is that if you just, if you didn't look at dynamics at all, at what's happening to price and time, but you just look, looked at those, those weird symbols Right, which which had those commutation relations. If you just look at looked at the all the generators of these groups, you would find that um, you, you you would get uh, you can for instance start with the higher dimensional group like a conformal group, and you can get the lower dimensional group by uh, actually fixing certain generators uh, or you know to constants, which is akin to taking the centralizer of the group if you if you know know what that means. So uh, you know by Playing this game, you you will actually get uh, an, another group uh, that that's uh, that lives in a lower dimension, uh, which will uh, be you know in in the case of say a null a null reduction, it will be the Schrodinger group, and in case of a spatial spatial reduction or by fixing the derivative along a spatial direction, it will be the m, m conformal group. So uh, it's not an accident; it, it's a it's a implication of group theory, you know. So, but uh, if you notice, you know, we've mostly been working with kind of linear theories, you know, they've, uh, none of these have had fancy nonlinear terms that would make them hard to solve in the first place. So, you know, maybe you would say that, okay, there's, what's the use of embedding in higher dimensions? The, the thing is, uh, so, uh, like, there is a much more general result, uh, which is much less established, you know, there's a lot of research going on in physics. In, in this field, and a lot of people are trying to understand it and prove it, but it, but this relates actually nonlinear theories now in uh, d dimensions to to the linearized versions in in uh, like d plus one dimensions, and now those linearized versions in d plus one dimensions are so called gravitational theories, you know, which have these uh, diffeomorphism and in, in, in invariance, and uh, uh, you know, uh, they're essentially uh, you can think of them as as living on geometric surfaces or manifolds so you know they're they're described by something called called a metric which kind of tells you how easy or hard it is essentially to go in different directions or like how one time step in uh, one direction in in your coordinate space uh, that translates in in the to the motion in in your canonical coordinates and uh, so the, the only coordinate invariant observable under symmetry assumptions is the the you know curvature which is uh, also is a rank four tensor, and uh, roughly, you know, if you don't know any of this, that that, that like doesn't matter. You can think of the curvature of the manifold as just the extent to which the angles uh, or the triangles drawn on the surfaces, uh, the extent to which the sums of their angles deviate from 180. If they're less than 180, there it's negatively curved. If there's more than 180, it's positively curved. And uh, there are three spaces that have basically constant curvature, uh, which live in uh, uh, in you know, a four-dimensional space-time, so it can be it's Minkowski, which is flat space. It's ADS negatively curved and DS, which is positively curved. And uh, the one that we'll be interested in is uh, ADS space because uh, like that's the one where you see the uh, the linearized theories live. Essentially, uh, these gravity duals live. And uh, so the uh, gra- gravity dual is not just a vague analogy between your boundary theory and your, your bulk theory. It, it's a very precise statement uh, and you know expectation values of your uh, boundary can be actually got from expectation values of the bulk by uh, fixing your uh, fixing a radial direction uh, to you know zero. And e- even the, the two point functions, the two point density functions match in, in this way that they, they can be gotten from this Kind of uh, you know like this kind of reduction to z equals zero. So it's it's not a fancy Fourier transform, partial Fourier transform like before, but uh, now it's actually something much simpler where you just uh, uh, take take the pullback of of that observable to that lower dimensional boundary, and you you get what you want. So um, you know before going into the more complicated cases, you can ask. Uh, what is the gravity dual to like just regular black holes or you know different kinds of Brownian motions, fractional Brownian motions, and it uh, like turns out that for a general general Brownian motion with no no nonlinear terms, uh, this uh, metric 
describes the 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 dual theory, the you know gravity dual, and uh, you can actually check that the the symmetry of this of this this you know like metric uh, is if you you know uh, if you actually reduce that to the surface z equals zero, it's the same as the scaling symmetry of black scholes for z equals two or crash dynamics for z equals one, or 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 for Lipschitz dynamic for for arbitrary z. So that's easy to check, but what's not what's highly non-trivial is that the dynamics in in the bulk and the boundary will also match. And uh, you know, in this case, uh, you know, you, your 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 log price expectation is just dual to a free field theory. Both have both theories have have kind of trivial dynamics. So uh, you know, we can uh, not we we can kind of uh, so it's a, tri it's a trivial case. So where the the story gets much more interesting is when your boundary theory is kind of like nonlinear. So for instance, if you have this, this kind of equation with fractional derivatives and arbitrary potential in, in the bulk, you know, like that will be dual to uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of equation, which looks like a free, free theory on, on a curved surface. And um, the curved surface is the, your, you know, Lifshitz background. And, uh, you know, you, you can, you can plug in the actual metrics to get an exact expression, uh, you know, for these kinds of uh, like variables. You, you can solve solve this this equation in, uh, for instance, Fourier space. You can solve solve it to get something uh, in terms of gamma functions. And the, the most remarkable thing I want you to take away from this is is that the the boundary equation is highly nonlinear and has um, fractional fractional derivatives. And would be otherwise very uh, very painful to solve, you know, probably pages of calculation. But um, the in, in the bulk, it's uh, essentially a, a kind of a linear theory. It's just some differential operator acting on um, acting on your wave function or your your expectation value of your price, you know, for, for instance. And all the, the nonlinearity is uh, kind of encoded in you know, this like mass term and this, this powers of R essentially, the, 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 there's no um, hidden uh, nonlinearity here. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the, this was in, in the case where initial conditions are well known and, uh, you know, you have these uh, free fields in, 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 the, in the bulk. So what, what's a more interesting case is when you would have black hole physics in the bulk and that would essentially correspond to having a, a probabilistic initial conditions for your theory on the boundary. So uh, before getting into that, you know, what is a black hole is just a solution to Einstein's equations, which, which uh, like describes highly compact massive objects where light cannot escape. And as Einstein said, you know, black holes are about God divides by, by zero. So, you know, you have uh, essentially uh, rough speaking, you know, you have space going this way and then, you know, you have like time, time, time going this way. And uh, you have, um, so uh, when you you have a mass that's compact enough, you know your uh, there'll be a point where your your spatial part of your metric turns into time, and then time turns into space. And so you know if you go inside a black hole, uh, going forward in in space is as inevitable as say going forward in time for us. And uh, you go ahead and you hit hit the similarity, which is actually a point, uh, but these coordinates don't make that evident. But uh, you know that's essentially what what a black hole is, and in terms of the metric, you know we spoke about metrics. So in terms of in terms of a metric, it can be described by you know like this this particular form, and uh, you see that um, when R goes to you know, two gm, there's a this seems to blow up, seems to be an uh, and kind of infinity there, and R equals zero. There seems to be an infinity there. This is the first one is just a coordinate artifact. Second one is an actual singularity, uh, which is at the center of the black hole, where radius goes to zero. Uh, your curvature goes to infinity, and, uh, and the uh, other one is just like just like donates a value of r beyond which you can, you can never come back. So you know, uh, there's this a very this whole literature on this. It's a big topic. So we're not going to talk much about the going to much of the details. Except that you know, uh, as most of you probably know, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020 was also awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black holes are a robust prediction of general uh, general relativity. Now, if there's one takeaway from my talk, it's that 
there are robust descriptions of stochastic dynamics with these thermal properties as well. And uh, what are these thermal properties? You know, they, uh, their for, forward, start, forward starting options have these thermal properties because there's, their initial statistics are not fixed, but they're average over, over a bunch of initial conditions. And um, also uh, what's, what's fascinating is that, is that crash, crash dynamics uh, can be fully described by, uh, by the, this black hole in the bulk, bulk as well. You know, so, so far we don't have a good model for the onset, onset of a crash and the end of the crash. Usually they have, people have piecewise models for, for different parts of it. But my, my claim is that by uh, adding these shocks uh, to uh, your uh, to your price price process, you know, you, you, which, which are uh, essentially quenched uh, SDEs, you, uh, and studying the the dual of, of of this quenching, which is akin to black hole formation in the bulk, you know, you can get a full fully analytical model, uh, fully analytical model of um, essentially crash of financial crashes, and. Uh, Again, you know, equations uh, simplify in the bulk. They're easy to solve. W what you end up describing is is a crash is basically on the boundary is is a, a gravitational shell actually collapsing, uh, collapsing to the bulk. And you'll see that uh, you get observables that match, and also that the uh, you get something very intuitive, which is that information transfer from large scales to to small scales happens, which is what you expect in a financial crash as well. And um, not only does this math describes the onset of a crash, but it also describes the end of a crash. Uh, the, the, the fact that, and that's akin to the black hole uh, essentially evaporating through Hawking, Hawking radiation, and it, it evaporates using uh, uh, by you know uh, this this formula in in, in, in like certain limits you, you get from from the earlier equation, and you, you get that your time to uh, time to um, evaporate, or which is the time for the crash to end or to subside, is obviously is much longer than the, the time for the onset of the crash. Uh, so, you know, you, this is a qualitative way where, you know, you, you have this, this black hole physics in the bulk that qualitatively reproduces what you expect uh, on the boundary, which is that crashes happen rapidly and then subside slowly. And, uh, and also that the flow of information goes from long to short, short time scales. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are other applications of this, uh, that uh, you can just you know like briefly look at uh, you, you, this bulk theories help you look at dynamical fractals which are much harder to do using just uh, the boundary SDs. You can try to reproduce volatility smiles or skews using RG or uh, based methods which which are roughly uh, you know the RG parameter is, is like a, is the uh, like radial parameter in in the holographic uh, holographic description and. You know, you can have different kinds of C theorems, which which give you results that SDs would not. Which is that you know, if you have um, two point density functions with these C values, and you know, you you change this the scale at which these are being being these are being calibrated. You know, these C functions will, will tell you that these Cs will actually decrease with with, with the scale. And the whole, whole again, th these are much more easy to see using the the bulk uh, the bulk theory than 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 the boundary, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I'm I'm done now, and I'm over time. There's uh, this is a huge topic, and uh, please, uh, you, you know, actually, uh, please uh, actually reach out to me if you have further questions, and if you would.